it will come to holidays. Maybe three people, but I, I, I don't know your salary. Someone, you can hear, <laughs> on the we don't get paid. We get paid as a salary. That would be fine. We don't want that. Could be. I assume what you said. We don't want to. Tony, would you come back? To so you've all got the correct um, submission now, and you've had time to read it. So um, where were we? I suppose uh, Councillor Randall wanted to ask a question. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it relates to what you presented. I must have had the foresight to see what, to um, s anticipate what you said in here. But it's about nothing to do with the airport. It's about CCOs. Um, are you anticipating, or do you, in your mind, in the Aero Club's mind, Forming the CCO is somehow going to be linked to the airport, is that how you see it? In your submission, you seem to make that point. I say it could be. So it is one way that the airport could be operated. I'm not saying that the council should operate the airport that way. It is one of the options that is open when the council is considering whether it would have a part or a role in the future of the airport if it decided it did want to have a role in the operation of the airport, a CCO is one of the ways it could do that. Or is, yeah, it's an option for doing that. So, one other, I mean, we support a CCO, but there's nothing in the long-term plan specifying what, you know, when it was set up. So, are you saying that you support it just generally? Um, I support the concept, yeah. um, because I have seen them operating elsewhere. So I have dealt with, um, for example, Far North Holdings in Northland mm. um, when I've been working on projects in that region in the past. Um, so I'm aware of how those, how those CCOs can operate effectively for the benefit of the district and for the council, for the community. And just the last point, um, do they actually make profits though? I mean, CCOs are independently run, et cetera, et cetera, but many of them around, New around the New Zealand aren't making any profits. Uh, the, they have the ability to make profits. Whether they are run to make a profit is another matter. So, I mean, I, I, that's a, you're, you're basically um, asking me to comment on how successful some CCOs might have been or not been, but in principle, I support the concept of a CCO. Yep. Councillor McCann, rebooting the question. Thank you. And through you, Mr Mayor. Uh, again, apologies that we were questioning you on things that you hadn't written. I am very impressed with your submission. Um, and so impressed I'll have to move off my pet subject of housing and go to CCOs and then change that to housing again. Do you understand um, that CCOs could be used also for the development of housing? I do, and, and yes. And would you, um, knowing their set-up, be in favour or, or accept that that could be a good use of a CCO as well? I agree, yeah. Thank you very much. Councillor Holliday. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, thank you, Tony. Sorry about the drama there. Um, look, I just want to be consistent in my questioning from um, some questions I asked last night in regards to a person submitting around the airport, and that was in relation to um, the surveys that were had strongly pointed towards um, community support for this, yet uh, what we're seeing in our submissions here is more on the lines of the opposite. We're seeing less support for the um, uh, for council getting involved in the airport um, as such. Do you have any comments on that at all? Um, so a survey is a statistical method of gaining information on public opinion, right? Um, so a random sample, I'm not a statistician, but I understand enough to be able to speak on this. A, a survey takes a random sample of constituents or population and um, obtains results from that s survey and determines whether those are statistically valid based on the sample size 
and the science of statistics. When it comes to, supply, to making submissions on a plan like this, you're tapping into people who are inclined to make submissions, and not everybody in the community is inclined to make submissions. It is not a random sample. So therefore, it's not surprising that when you get people who are passionate enough to write submissions, you're going to get a somewhat different picture to a straight-out statistical random sample survey. Thank you, Tony. I think that's all the questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time and presenting your submission. Thank and you very much. We apologize for the hiccup in the process, which has been firing really well. Probably partly of our making. We should have made an official club submission. Council <laughs> India. Oh, sorry. Tony, sorry, I was just um, a bit late in pushing the button. I do have a question, and it's uh, along the lines of um, my colleague's question, um, in that this LTP is Council's major annual consultation process through which we get a mandate from the public. It's really the only formal process in which we get a mandate from the public. Can I ask you, if, um, if it comes out that the mandate from statistically from this process is uh, not in favour of Council having further um, taking further activity investigations in the airport. How will the Aero Club, I'm really interested to know, how, well, how would you yourself um, discuss that or, or how, would, how will you process that going forward? I'm just really um, interested in because we've had some really strange things being said all over the media. About, about the airport? About the airport, about council having a role in the airport. So if, if the mandate we get from the public through this process is that we that, that there is not the support for council to have further role or any additional role in the airport, I'm really interested to know how that will be perceived. By, perceived. Um, so we don't pretend to dictate public opinion. We, we were heartened by the support that was evident from the surveys multiple surveys um, if democracy is democracy and if the council at the end of this process concludes that it does not have a role in the airport then that is the council's uh, um, prerogative and um, you know it, I, I totally understand that you will listen to the submissions but I hope you will also take account of the sampling that's been done in, in community opinion surveys as, as part of that and um, that any number, any organisations or segments of the community can effectively gang up on a process like this and um, flood submissions. Um, we, you know, as a club, something like a hundred of our members we believe have made submissions. Um, but people from the other side of the equation will also have banded together and made multiple submissions. So that is the process. Um, we accept it. We won't give up the battle, um, but we will um, refocus. <laughs> yeah. Councillor Hanford. Kia ora, Tony. I just have a quick question around um, slightly kind of not to the contents of your submission, but I think good background understanding, at least for me. In terms of the membership of the Aero Club, what proportion of the membership is from, is, is Carpety residents, and what proportion is people from outside of the district? So, yeah, very fair question. Um, and that has come up, actually, internally for us in the context of Templeton Group suggesting we should move to Foxton. Um, so we did some demographics on our membership, and I think, um, from memory, the numbers were something like 90% of our members live between, including Kapiti, south to Wellington, and about 60% of our members live south of Kapiti. So um, I think in that context, it's important to remember that those members who commute to Kapiti to fly spend money here. So I'm a classic of that. I live just outside Kapiti at Pukirua Bay. Um, I'm up here regularly, um, partly through my management role at the club, but also to fly. 
And when I'm here, I do my grocery shopping here. I go to cafes. I buy clothes, magazines, books. Um, all of those sorts of things that I would otherwise probably do either in Porirua City or in Wellington City. And that would be typical of a lot of our members. They'll come here from out of, out of town and spend money here. And they spend money at the club where we have instructors living in Kapiti, staff living in Kapiti, Grant Twaddle, whose submission you, you were looking at before, lives in Kapiti, um, has his family here and raised his children here. So, you know, um, we have strong connections. Those members who come from out of town are spending money here, and I think that's valuable. I think we're done. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, time. everyone. Cheers. Well, the next submitter is not until. Oh, are you you're here already, Anna Carter? Do you want to do you want to do it now, Anna Carter from Rikirangi. Thank you. Kia ora, um, my name's Anna Carter and um, I'm speaking to the Reikorangi Residents Association submission on the long-term plan. Um, we um, have based our submission on our strategy, that uh, our vision statement that we developed in 2017, 2018 um, with our community and a copy of that's with the submission. We spoke three years ago to the previous long-term plan um, and what came out of that submission was the sort of things that we were looking for, which I'm really grateful to say that Council heard us then, three years ago, and responded. Um, actually, sorry, before I do that, I, there is something I do want to acknowledge, and, and that is the passing of Wolf Wright. Um, Wolf and Jan uh, were incredible. Well, but Jan, they are incredible people in our community. Um, I like to call them like the grandparents of our community, the grandparents who sat at our table. And it's with a lot of sadness that Wolf passed and that the cafe closed. Um, they used to run, uh, that have, you know, people would celebrate birthdays and weddings. I got married there. Um, the church parishioners would go down after church and have, you know, Jan would cook her scones with her jam and her cream. So real a part, a strong, strong part of our rural community and um, it's really, it's with a lot of sadness that that wolf has passed and also that that, that pottery and the things that we did as a community in that place is sort of finished and I'm really hopeful that into the future we'll see something else pop up in its place um, places like that are really important for rural communities and we somehow need to be able to give them a place and a space um, through planning for rural communities. Putting that all aside, I do want to just say thank you to the work that Council did do following our submission on the last LTP. So um, we'd asked for Council to transfer $70,000 that was going to go into upgrading our tennis court to upgrading our domain hall so that it was accessible for all, all people. We had ramps put in, we had accessible to uh, toilet and shower facilities, so that was done. And, Fantastic. So now someone like Sam Eddy, Wolf and Jan's daughter, can come to our monthly get-togethers or you know our workshops that we run at our hall and our domain. We also saw um, the speed reduced on our rural roads, which was really, really important. It came down from an open speed limit to 80 kilometres an hour and 60 kilometres an hour in some places. And um, we saw signs go up, which we'd asked for. We saw trees, which would have been an extremely expensive job, come down. Um, that we were concerned about affecting our road safety. So really thank you, thank you for that. We had um, just completed in the last three years um, a project that we worked closely with on the, with the Waikanae Community Board and Department of Conservation to put a toilet at the end of the Mangoni South Road. There's a little bit of work left to do on that, some landscaping, but again, thank you to the Waikanae Community Board for supporting that project. And our next tranche of work under this 
for the next three years, in the, in the, at the least, is to work on um, developing a strategy for our domain. And again, the Waikanae Community Board have come to the table and funded um, the development of a landscape strategy. And we would really like to see the support of council in, uh, in, as that strategy is developed. And we're going to work closely with council's um, parks and reserves team and also Kia to Kitai on that process, obviously along with our community. Um, one of the, so that, that is one of the things that we're looking for support from for council is just support through that process. Finally, we'd like to see a connection with Waikanae. That's something that we've been asking for for a while and a walkway, off-road walkway, cycleway, bridleway. It's such a dangerous stretch of road and again, there's a little section past the quarry which we really would like to see widened as well. Um, and I'd just like to draw your attention and I will table a, um, a funding application that with Land Matters, which is the company I work for, are putting to all of the community boards for a um, Kapiti Awa link track strategy. And so um, that is, we see that piece of work as probably contributing to what we're looking for up in our valley, which is looking for a connection up from Waikanae up into the community domain. But if I can table that um, to circulate. Um, and so I realise I've gone over time, but um, and there's probably other other elements uh, that... No you, no, you haven't gone over time. I haven't? Oh, OK, great. Can I keep talking? I'll keep talking then. <laughs> Um, and, uh, if you make the main point, then you have a chance to listen to the questions and inter right. interface with that. Okay. So that really the last point that I really want to raise is um, we're looking for support for increasing and improving biodiversity in the valley. And, you know, with Rob Cross gone, that's a big gap. Um, and we know that he did a lot of work at the Reikorangi, um, at Devil's Elbow and the planting there. We really want to see that continue. And we also would like to be able to see the vision for getting FIO, which is the blue dark, back up into our catchment. Um, and we think pest control was going to be quite critical to that. So those are sort of the key points, really, the domain access and pest control. And I think if I've missed anything, you'll pick it up in my submission. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, you are aware that the Work for Nature program is on, Jobs for Nature, and you are in the community is involved in that. Yes, Sarah, we've asked Kita Kitai to come and speak to us. They're still in the process of allocating how they, how they work that program into their program. Um, we're also aware of the funding through Jobs for Nature and the catchment management planning that's going on. And um, actually, we're working with Peter Hannaford over that um, individually. There are landowners individually working with Peter over that. And we're going to be organising him to come along and speak to our our community. So, yep, we are aware of that. I don't believe there's funding for roading net upgrades or cycleway upgrades, but certainly pest control, for sure, there is there's potential um, there under that program. Councillor Elliot. Oh, look, thank you um, so much, Anna, for coming and bringing your submission. Um, yeah, I too was married at Rikirangi oh. Potteries here. Awesome night. Um, look, I that was great. But I just wanted to ask you, has um, the Associ Residents Association, have you connected with New Zealand Predator Free, Predator Free New Zealand at all, which is a nationwide pro program for communities to become predator free themselves in order to uh, connect the dots and make the country predator free by 2050. So um, yeah. really recommend you go yeah. on that website. Yeah. And um, yeah, so if you No, we haven't. Okay, we and will. just secondly, because as you say, it's such an important part of community connectivity in the Rikirangi, is the pottery's property available for releasing? And it's just a curious, and I'm asking because I'm just thinking about that as being still available alongside other council owned sites. Um, I can't, I couldn't speak to that. Okay. Um, but. Certainly, there are. We, we are really excited about opportunities that we could look into for the domain yep. in that space. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, Councillor Bravanov. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Anna, for coming along today and speaking and speaking to um, to the submission and, and setting it out really nicely. You know, saying exactly you know what your um, your aims are for. So, my first question is in relation to some of the points that you have made for immediate action outside the ecosystem um, request, you know, the infrastructure and the hall, 
do you know if there's any money in the long-term plan for any of this work? Um, I actually couldn't find it. Okay. Um, and I, I think that would be something that would be good to investigate. Sorry, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, we picked up that there, were 20, there was going to be 20,000 allocated to the community boards, and we've obviously mentioned that in the submission and looking to seek an increase there, potentially, because we could apply for funding through those discretionary grant schemes. But no, um, no. I can't answer that. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do some work on that. Thank you. Um, so just in relation to the ecosystem health, um, as has been mentioned, Jobs for Nature, mm. um, and it's my understanding that one of their main aims is for pest and um, weed control, so mm -hmm. I'm quite happy to follow up in that area. Mm -hmm. um, but, because I'm, I'm sure that, you know, that, you know you're part of the, the, um, the catchment mm. for, for the Waikanae River, so to me it makes yeah. sense that. Absolutely. There is some work that is done in that area, yep. and ha having those communication channels open. And I think one of the things that um, the earlier group, the Rivers group, um, that Simon and Janice were involved in with the Blue Duck proposal was that, that they really lacked a coordinator to coordinate it. And so hopefully Kiwita Kiwita Katai can take over that role, yes. or perhaps Rob Cross's replacement at council can come on board to sort of facilitate it. But that's what's difficult, is it's sort of incremental landowners sort of doing you know, their bit without um, an overall strategy. Yeah, I think Theo is one of the um, mountains to the sea pro things, long term right. plans. Right, yeah, great. Thank you. Doesn't seem to be any more questions. Thank you for coming and presenting your submission. I might just add my own personal, I know people have been married there. Um, we used to take my little kids up there to the cafe mm. and feed the, feed the animals, yeah. including my kids. <laughs> feed your, kid, feed feed your kids animals. to the animals. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks for your time. I'll leave that for the Right, the next one is 11.45. Well, the speaker's here. Sir Glenn K. Wiggs, please. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, last night you heard um, from Gerald Rice on behalf of the Waikanae Beach Resident Society, uh, and uh, as, as that's a submission we endorse, and uh, this submission really is a subset of that submission. Um, we reside at 38 uh, Packy Street, Waikanae Beach, and we've owned the property for over 50 years. Uh, we're back onto the, uh, the Rangihiroa Domain, which is surrounded by houses in Timoana Road, Napaki Street and Rangihiroa Street, uh, with entrances from all three streets. About 45 years ago, the then council reconstructed the reserve, or part of it, for the purpose that it would be used as a freedom reserve, and they recontoured the whole reserve. And ever since it's been used, um, well used, by children, teenagers and adults. And the teenagers get in there and do what they want to do and build bike tracks and do all sorts of funny, uh, fun things. Um, that part of the reserve which is occupied by the men's shed was previously a council yard. Uh, and the northern part was used as a plant nursery, the northern part of the reserve. And that part of, that res of the reserve has quite a variety of quite attractive trees which were left over from the nursery. The remainder when it was recontoured, it was planted with pines, gums and macrocarpa. And, as time, and uh, as time has gone by, they are well past their use-by date and are dangerous and dead and live branches are falling several times a week, particularly over the last two or three days with the high winds. The trees provide a constant risk of injury or death from falling branches or falling trees, which a pine did in a storm a few years ago. Furthermore, there are some trees near uh, property boundaries that not only block sun, but also could fall over the boundaries, causing damage. Now, a few years ago, we did um, extensive alterations to our batch and turned it into a house. Um, and, uh, and in doing so, there were additional building costs incurred because we live in an area designated by the council as a high wind zone. Um, we were happy to pay the extra, as it was the price for additional safety. But the pines and gums 
are also in the same high wind zone. And we submit that the Council also needs to take extra care, albeit at extra cost, just such as the price of safety. Now I want to go on to proportionality. Waikanae Beach contributes 9.4 per cent of the total race. You heard that last night from Gerald. And under the LTP, only 0.17 per cent of the budgeted capital expenditure on parks and open spaces of 181 million will be spent at Waikanae Beach. And this is not in accord uh, with best practice, the best practice proportionality principle that you heard about from Gerald last night. Now we are asking for a tiny fraction of the 181 million, um, $50,000. Um, and I estimate that to be the cost of removing the dangerous trees and replacing them with native trees. And that would make the domain safe and we'd all be able to sleep better at night knowing that the risk of injury of death to the public is removed. The men shed favour the removal of the trees, especially near their boundary. They have volunteered to nurture uh, replacement native trees in their nursery prior to planting, uh, and additionally several neighbours have agreed to water and maintain new trees until they are established. The reserve then will be a safe and attractive place. Finally, one further matter. I received a copy of an emailed, very brief, eight-line submission from Mary Bernard uh, of Bernard Gardens, which was sent to the Council. And she's quite an expert. Her submission, which was unsolicited by us, makes exactly the same recommendation that I make to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if my memory is right in terms of documentation that I've seen a decade ago, those council had sections of land around the district which were purposely planted with trees that could be harvested. I think this is one of them. No, I don't think, I don't think they could be harvested. They just uh, dotted all over the place, mainly gums. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and, and pine trees. And, and, and yeah. a lot anyway, of them still uh, have um, dead branches. Um, have you or anybody else made a service request? Uh, we have made a request to the council. Uh, and the council officers have been very good, and Philip Stratton uh, carried out some. Uh, they, they, uh, what they did was um, um, cut down some of the dead branches and a couple of the dead trees. Um, not all the dead branches have been removed, um, but and uh, and then they came back again to do more. And now you're going to have ongoing problems as the trees reach the end of their life one by one. Uh, my, my submission is that it's cheaper to get in there and pay the $50,000, remove the lot, uh, and then you don't have to come back every few months and, 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 and um, carry out uh, maintenance on the okay, trees. We, we, we've got a question from Councillor Pravanov, yep. your, your councillor. Yes. Uh, can I ask first? Huh. <laughs> Let me ask the Councillor Randall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, thank, thank you, Glenn, for your submissions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, three years ago, when we discussed the long-term plan then, you made submissions to the council about best practices. Yep. And I just wondered, I thought it was very interesting, and I, I was wondering if you would mind repeating that. Secondly, um, I think that... Um, at that time, you also said that the price of your property then now equals the amount of, you, uh, amount of money you pay on rates. Uh, when you purchase a property then, 15 oh, years yes, ago, yes, that'd be right. your rate bill <laughs> is about the same as your property, yeah, as yeah. the price of the property you purchased. Yes, yes. In fact, the rates bill, the annual rates bill now exceeds the uh, initial price of the property way back about 50 years ago, 55 years ago, yes. And, and thirdly, yeah, such as the ravages of inflation. And thirdly, because I'm very keen on that, is monarch butterflies. Oh. Yeah, so if you might like yes. to touch on yes, those three, yes, three matters. Thank you. Right. Uh, first of all, I'll, can I deal with the, uh, the matter of, of best practice principle? Um, and the fact that is, uh, the New Zealand government has adopted best practice principles uh, and, um, uh, and they're available on the internet. In fact, I can leave you with a, leave you with a copy of it. But I'll, I'll read out the first one. Uh, 
the first one, which is the proportionality principle. Now, these principles are very similar to those which are designated by APEC and OECD and other countries like the USA and, and, uh, and, and, uh, Europe, and in Europe. The first one says, proportionality. The burden of the rules on their enforcement should be proportionate to the benefits that are expected to result. Another way to describe this principle is to place the emphasis on a risk-based cost-benefit regulatory framework and risk-based decision-making by, by, by regulators. This would include a regime that's effective. Uh, this would include that a regime is effective for any change as benefits that outweigh the cost of disruption. Now, I'm saying a matter of expenditure on, on when it comes back to health and safety, then that's part of best practice regulation. An example of, of the, where, the exa where, where the council has enacted uh, best practice uh, uh, the proportionality principle was that there was the fine for, for driving cars on beaches, where you reduced it from 750 down to I think 250, because the fine was too high, and it was out of proportion. And in fact, the police were reluctant to prosecute anyone because because it was out of proportion. So that and. Um, I really, I've done, done quite a work in my lifetime on, on, on best practice regulation, and, I, and if you adopt best practice regulation, uh, it is, of course, a, a, a more effective way of, of, um, of, of, of administration. The second question, oh, the amount of butterflies. Um, in, in the, uh, uh, I, I, I planted one swan plant some years ago, uh, and now I have thousands well, not thousands, but several around the country, which, which my wife Kay drives, drives her nuts. Uh, as a result, we do have lots and lots of mon mon butterflies in, in, in the area, and uh, they've wintered over in one of the macrocarpas. Uh, and uh, there were, the other day, there were, oh, a week or so ago, there were several hundred. Uh, now they've dwindled somewhat when I checked this morning, um, but uh, they're still there, and they're wintering over on the macrocarpa, hanging on. So if you go to the reserve, have a look. It's uh, really, really worthwhile. It's, pretty, uh, it's, uh, it's quite, in quite interesting. And that is when I, in, in my submission, I say, leave that massive car for a moment. It's quite a neat, uh, neat one. And the one next to it, uh, there's, um, in fact, leave most of the massive carpets alone. They're, they're quite nice, nicely shaped trees. And don't shed branches just at this stage. They've got another 50 years to go, I think. All right. Um, thank you very much for your submission. Um, Thank you. Thank you. The Pakakriki school children are outside. I think it would be good if we can bring them in. Yeah, but the, if you can give him. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that issue as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah
it's from a more remote. The, the bigger one is the, the frame. I went out today and there's several frames. Yeah. 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 Look, um, can we? Yeah, um, we're doing a little thing called Melty Pete. Right. Sophie Hanford was a school teacher just now. <laughs> uh, welcome to the Pakakariki Primary School children. Welcome to this Fare. Um, we've got 25 minutes for you all, so I'll let your teachers organize you to speak to us. Yep, where you go. Hi, I'm Melody's Judge and I'm here to talk to you about electric cars and how they can help with our environment. Cars and other vehicles propose a serious problem to our environment. That's why they are that's why electric cars are a very well good. I propose that more pressure should be put onto local businesses to convert to electric cars. Not only can it be more cost efficient, it can help appeal to it, sorry, it can help appeal to customers if they know that the company that they're buying from is doing their part to help the environment. Also, I propose that putting more electric car charges around Carpety and also possibly lower, lowering the cost of them can help um, the public maybe be more um, uh, inclined to purchase an electric vehicle. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Isabella. I am talking about the airport and the airplanes. I think the airport should be more accessible and yeah. And because most people who live in Carpety go to the airport to go on holiday around New Zealand, because also cars, ha yeah, 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 uses a lot more petrol, yeah, yeah, uses a lot more petrol to travel around New Zealand, or to go to Wellington in cars, airport, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Mine? Hi, my name is Lily. I'd like the council to do everything they can to put pressure on the regional council to improve public transport in these ways. One, one cost. There's two ways I see this happening. Make it cheaper so that it's more accessible to people, so people can take jobs further away without having to worry about the travel costs. And this will also discourage people with cars to take them and that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Another way you could do this is to reverse the child and adult costs since adults take them more frequently so it will probably be about the same amount of money in the long term. Electrify. Make public buses electric. This would reduce greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere and probably reduce climate change related costs further down the line. Climate change is very real, so um, please start doing something. What's the point of saying something is an emergency if like, it's not going to be treated as one? Thank you. Do you want to say something about the airport as well? Okay. All right, if you come back up here, you guys that just spoke, because they might have questions. Okay. 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 
it would be more useful if you've made all your presentations oh, yes, and then we can answer questions. questions. Hello, I'm Sana and I'm 12 years old and these are my two friends. These are some other things we think are important. Marine reserves. If we have another marine reserve, we can protect more native fish and underwater creatures like power, kinna and local seaweeds. If we have a retirement home link to a child care, an early child care centre, the elderly can be nearer their grandchildren and other kids. It will also be good for the kids because they can have a story time or something from someone they already know. Thanks for listening to my part of this speech. Now over to Scarlett. Hi, my name is Scarlett and I'm going to talk about Māori language and how it should be more accessible, especially for older people, because we're getting taught at school, although they didn't. And now I'm going to talk about cheaper university slash politic. Some people don't get very good jobs um, because they don't have the money to go to university or a polytech. Now I'll hand it over to Amelia. Um, hi, I'm Amelia. I'm 12 years old. Um, and I think that um, the um, weekly um, rubbish collection bin should be safer, um, secure, so that they don't tip over in the wind, as that is a problem where um, we are. It's windy. And... Um, that there should be more um, recycling and compost bins in public, not only um, just rubbish bins, also plastic and compost bins as well. Um, thank you for listening to us. Hi, my name is uh, my name is Tom, and I just have a few bullet points I want to talk about. So, um, I want to talk about the ocean. Uh, we should uh, look after the uh, sea and make sure that our native um, fish don't um, go extinct or anything like that. Um, we should um, uh, and put a lot of water fountains around the place so that. People don't have to uh, go to the uh, um, dairy uh, to buy water, like water bottles and plastic water bottles. Um, we should like ban cheap plastic bottles and bags and do a lot of recycling. Um, and we should just plant a lot of trees if we can, like um, farmland that isn't being used should be planted with tons of trees to um, suck up all the carbon emissions. Thanks. Hi, my name is Rose. I am 11, nearly 12, and I think we need more compostable dog poo bags. We could have bins around parks and beaches which are full of compostable poo bags for your dogs. I also think we need more water fountains around local places so people don't buy plastic water bottles. And you could at least try to make the house prices lower for my friend is getting kicked out of her house because her family can't afford it. I think you should make train prices lower too so then people will use the train instead of their cars so they won't pollute. Also, back on the houses, when you kick someone out of their house, you're just kicking someone out of the house. For them, you're kicking them out of a out of their home, where they had all their memories. It could be where they had their first steps, said their first words, because it's not a house, it's a home. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Lucy. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lucy, and I'm ten years old. And I think we should be more reserved, like Carpety Island, around the place. It doesn't have to be an island. It could be just like it could be anywhere. It could just have a whole lot of forest somewhere where they've trapped predators or just or put fences up around it. So there could be more native birds because they're going extinct, and we need to do something about it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eliza, and I'm uh, I'm ten years old. I'm just gonna say we should put bells on our cats so native birds don't die, and eco-friendly farms would be good too. Thank you. <laughs> Kia ora, my name is Marlon, and I'm just gonna say that I think we should have more um, nature reserves dotted around Kapiti to um, protect our native birds and trees. Hi, I'm Alex. I am 10. Um, I'm trying to talk about the extent of the, nat of the extinct and endangered animals of, of birds, really, of New Zealand. Um, for starters, did you know that we had our own, own species of duck? Well, Three, actually, um, and uh, thrush. We had a native thrush. Had keyword. Uh, ah, yep. Um, the, the endangered, the most endangered bird in New Zealand is the fairy tern. But if you've never heard of it, that's normal because most people haven't because we choose to ignore that there are so much endangered and extinct animals. And it's there, it's over our heads, but sometime in the future there's going to be some kid who's going to go, how the heck did we not um, freak out about climate change? And Yeah, that's all I can remember. Bye. <laughs> I'm Annika. I am 10 years old and I'm going to be talking about technology. The reason for this is because I believe technology could help stop many problems including fossil fuels, littering and many more. Ways to produce power could be the energy from waves, more windmills and wind turbines and of course solar panels. We could start to use search engines like Ecosia where every 45 or so searches a tree gets planted. Also electric cars. We need to help more people get them and for the people who already have them more places to charge them <clears throat> also internet scams are starting to get very bad so we should try and stop that faster internet would be good because then people wouldn't have to drive into the city to work i know some people train but for the people who work on the other side of the city that isn't really an option for them as well this isn't really related to technology but we need more rubbish bins and more variety of, in them too. Like there are some rubbish bins with two holes. One says recycling and the other says rubbish. You think that they are split up but they are not. And this is sad because people think they are helping out the environment but they aren't. So we need to get more bins. Recycling rubbish and all of the others. Especially in places like Coastlands. It's a mall. We need more bins in there. Um, also monthly rubbish cleanups would be great. We could do fundraisers to help save up money to do all of these things. I'd be keen to help with those. Thank you for listening. I hope this gives you some ideas on things to do in the future to help out the environment. Hi, my name's Audrey. And my name is Esme. The housing... Pro the... The housing prices in Paikaukariki are getting higher and higher. <sighs> getting higher and higher. In the future, only people with a large amount of money will be able to live there. Here's an example. My friend Isme, she is going to have to move out of her house because her dad can't afford the rent. This is not just... In Pukekohe, it's in lots of other places in the world. Thank you for inviting us here and letting us speak. I, I just want to say that I'm 
I just I just want to add um, it's kind of a little bee in my bonnet anybody that comes to our community board meetings because um, I've got sorry yeah <laughs> I'm used to just everybody hearing me I just got a big voice you know um, so I just wanted to say that um, my students were quite surprised that they were the only students who kind of got asked about this and inputted um, and I'd just say please um, council staff you can see I, we, me and Sophie didn't prompt any of those thoughts we just said this is the plan for the next 20 years what would you like to talk about they're really really switched on and in 20 years they're mostly going to be in their 30s you know so please when you're consulting on things um, you're very very welcome at our Kira, and I'm sure you'd be welcome at others okay. right um there was a fantastic delivery of a range of views, and it's so very Pakagriki. Um, can I ask the elected members to give them an applause? <laughs> it's uh, question time now. Questions? Councillor Holiday. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I had a question for Josie. I think it was. Um, I saw you, we. I guess you can't ask everyone all your questions, but um, you talked to the litter traps, uh, and um, you had some ideas around litter traps. So I was wondering if you could explain that idea a little bit more. Um. Well, some of the rubbish is going into the drains. And um, if we used litter traps, then we might be able to trap the litter. Something that's been proposed, um, Joe's not, not here, but um, it's actually putting socks over the uh, drains when they come out at the end. You think that might be a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Josie. Much appreciated. Councillor Hanford. Kia ora all of, you, all of you and thank you so much for coming along today and as you can tell um, by the response from the councillors we really appreciate you coming coming along and you know taking that step to stand up in front of us. I can understand that it's a pretty daunting thing that's why I wanted to make sure that none of you were too nervous but if you were you definitely didn't show it. So um, I've got a few questions. Amelia if you wouldn't mind um, just, just providing me a bit of an understanding um, or giving me some some kind of well, your your view on whether you think like clips, kind of the attached bin lids to the bin, would help with some of that problem of bins tipping over and and waste kind um, of flowing out into the streets and yeah, because um, it's when they tip over and then the lids will often fly up. So if yeah, there if there are clips to keep the lids on, that would definitely um, decrease the number of rubbish getting around because often rubbish which is on the streets has come out of bins so yeah. awesome thank you um, I also had a question if that's okay Mr Mayor for um, Scarlett about Maori language and so my question to you Scarlett is what are, what are some ways that you think us as people who are um, elected to be in these roles and as councillors and people on community boards what are some ways you think we can all you know do better with te reo Māori should we be taking classes should we learn how to better pronounce words what's your opinion yeah I think there should be maybe like a school for it or something mm. okay. like a different building or something yeah cool okay and can I just ask one more just a couple more <laughs> Tom I'd like to ask a question you mentioned water fountains um, I was wondering if you had any specific ideas of where we might need more water fountains. Is it malls? Is that I don't know. Do we want do we want them more in parks? Do we want them just along the streets? Or what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah. So I was just thinking. Uh, some of my uh, other um, friends who were doing the environment one were talking about that as well. But uh, I'm just thinking like. If you had more water fountains, just in like public areas or like where people go to a lot, like say someone's thirsty and they want some water, instead of going to like buying something, um, like a bottle that's in plastic, and then they just throw away the bottle, and then that goes to a dump, and more trash and rubbish everywhere, um, you can just have a fountain, more fountains, people can just drink from them. Mm. And it's free, and there's no plastic. 
I think that's an awesome idea. And even if there was some way of us being able to see how many plastic bottles we've saved from landfill as a result of that, it would be cool to tie in both that, that waste element. And yeah, that's awesome. I'll Thanks. let some of my fellow councillors ask questions Thanks. and then maybe if there's time I'll come back. Councillor Bravanov. Thank you, Mr Chair. So thank you again, um, everyone, for coming along. And I have to congratulate you on providing your thoughts on a really wide range of matters. And hopefully this is the beginning of, of your um, having your say in terms of, of our communities. So I have, um, so there's lots and lots of information that you provided, but I, I'm just um, picking up on one theme, and that was um, comments made by Sarah, Tom, Lucy and Alex uh, around, um, I suppose, setting up reserves and um, trying to preserve species becoming extinct. So one of the questions or comments that was made about was, you know, setting up a reserve, I think it was actually a marine reserve, and I'm just wondering, I think that was Sarah, uh, about where she thought that potentially could be. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Um, well, um, I'm not entirely sure, but somewhere where there is a lot of probably underwater plants would be good to protect those plants as well as the animals that would live there because I think the plants are important too, not just the animals. So I'm not entirely sure where there would be mm -hmm. lots of underwater plants, but yeah, just... Thank you. Welcome. Councillor McCann. Three, Mr Mayor. Thank you. It's been really great to hear your ideas and it was also good to hear about, it wasn't good to hear about, but it was what we needed to hear when you talked about your friend Esme potentially losing her house. It's really important that we hear as councillors the effect and the, the damage that could do to be scared about where you're going to live. Um, but I did want to ask some questions about all those people who talked about electric cars. For the record, we've bought one because we want to do our little bit. Can I ask you, um, how many of your parents um, actually own an electric car? <laughs> well, uh, uh, both my parents own electric cars, so, yeah. Can I have a show of hands? Can you put hands up if you, if you own an electric car? And do you think that um, not only do we need to provide more charging stations and things like that, do you think you guys can actually try and convince your parents that they should be using electric cars? Because I know, as someone who liked to drive fast when I was a little bit older than you, I thought electric cars weren't powerful, but they really are, and they're amazing. Have you tried to convince your parents and or thought about making videos and things like that to, to show how cool they are? Uh, yeah, um, definitely that could very definitely work. Cool. Awesome, thank you. Council Holiday. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr Mayor, uh, through you. Um, I actually had some, a question, I think it was for Annika and Rose. Um, it was around, um, I think it was a fantastic idea around biodegradable uh, ba doggy bags, doggy poo bags and everything. But you also talked about perhaps having more rubbish bins and that sort of thing. And I was just wondering, I wanted to turn that around a little bit because if we have more rubbish bins, it, it costs us all a lot more to look after them and to empty them. But do you think there's perhaps um, room for perhaps people to be ta taking their rubbish back home more rather than putting it into bins? Uh, and that way they can perhaps we do their recycling at home and, and, and dispose of their rubbish at home? Um, yeah, and we could also do things to make, um, more encourage shops for less, like some of my friends said, um, less plastic so that there's less need for rubbish bins around. Um, yeah. <laughs> Councillor Holborough, but before I can I just ask for your help. I've got an electric car. But you know when previously when I had a petrol car, I can go to the petrol station and get it filled up and it's sheltered. But with the electric car, when the weather is bad, and I've got to charge my batteries, the car, it's not sheltered. You can't have the mayor freezing in the cold. <laughs> so do you know somebody that you can write a letter to on my behalf? <laughs> no, I'm serious. 
Think about it. Councillor Holbrook. Um, we could do things like how petrol stations have shelters, uh, mm. electric charging stations with shelters. So that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to throw this question open to anybody today who talked about climate change, which was quite a lot of you. If you can think of one more thing you think we should be doing as a council, what do you think it should be? What's the most important thing, the first thing that pops into your head? I think we should definitely be um, not just introducing electric cars, but definitely introducing hybrid cars more, because hybrid cars will be better as a good transition from petrol to electric cars and petrol is better for longer journeys if, um, until we have better technology to have electric cars charging full and letting it have longer. Yeah, Tom, go, go. Grab the microphone. Uh, I was thinking that it would also be a good idea to like do electric buses and planes. Um, and to just, yeah, well, yeah, just electric buses and planes. While you're standing there, Tom, I want to, con yeah. is it Tom? Yeah. I want yeah. to congratulate you on bringing up the water bottles and the drinking fountains because when our staff recently did a waste audit, the, the little drinking bottles, the little pump bottles, they found heaps and heaps of those. It was a major problem in terms yeah. of our waste supply. And so as a consequence, we are planning to put more drinking fountains throughout the district so mm. we could come back to the Kura and ask where you think they might might be able to go in Paikakariki maybe yeah. that would be really great um, I think something we could do to like help the climate would be even monthly um, rubbish clean ups like everyone would like even you know you could shut off in like small villages like Paikakariki where I live you could shut off some roads and people could walk along the roads, walk along the footpaths, go in the bushes and try and find rubbish and then you know we could count it up in the end and like every month we could see and hopefully each month there would be less and less and less and less rubbish until eventually hopefully there'd be no rubbish to pick up. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, also, um, dog poo bag, um, compostable dog poo bags, um, you should put them like around the park and the beaches because so, most dog poo bags are made out of plastic and they just put them in the bin and like, yeah. Thank you very much for coming here today. And that's been fantastic. And um, Sophie, you want to say something at the end? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll ask a question, I'll throw it open to anyone that wants to answer. Um, I'd like to know what some of you, or what, you know, whoever's keen to jump up and answer this question, what you're most excited about for the future? What are you, what are you most hopeful for in terms of the future? Because I know um, there are some things like the climate crisis and house prices rising and all those things that seem quite daunting and intimidating to think that we're going to have to, um, to, to be the generation that predominantly grapples with that, but I'd like to know what makes you excited and what makes you hopeful? So anyone, just jump up. Um, I, well, I'm just looking forward for the future, if it's a good one, and that's a big if at this point. Um, I just want, to, I'm looking forward to it, uh, for my, own gener my generation to enjoy the environment. Cheaper house pricing and more electric cane and more some more train stops because most people catch the train as well as busing and driving cars. So more train stops in Ramati and stuff. I'm looking forward for more science development into eco-friendly ways to like cook and stuff because I want to be a chef. Um, I'm quite hopeful for the house prices because I've lost a lot of good friends because they've had to move somewhere else because they've been kicked out.
Um, well, something I'm excited for in the future, ironic because the subject I've been talking about is technology, but just to see, like, 20, 30 years ago, there wasn't, there was no smartphones, there was no iPads, no computers, which most of you guys have, and stuff, and so in the future, 20 or 30 years in the future, like, who knows, we might even have like we won't even need phones we'll just have like holograms that will just pop out of our brains that will be like someone's calling you <laughs> well i'm hoping that after hearing all our ideas that you've put some of them into action and in the future that that's what it will be like and i think all the ideas are really good so then it will create a better world I'd be happy if the prices for university went down. I'm looking forward to in 20 or 30 years' time to be able to look back at this and think, wow, we had to do this. <laughs> I just want climate change to be over um, by the time I'm like 30 or something. <laughs> Um, Lucy loves penguins and she probably wants climate change to stop um, melting icebergs and killing penguins. <laughs> <laughs> and I want my generation to have, like, love the plants and our environment, like, better. I'm hopeful for more compostable things like dog poo bags and um, drink bottles and things like that. Um, I'm looking forward to um, more like electric, like magnet trains that like repel on the magnets on the thing because right now we have metal and is that made out of foil? Mm, I don't know but I know what you mean. Which yeah. Is. And like maybe more and more train stops. <laughs> you can travel around. <laughs> what about your houses? Um, then to only be like two dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Thank you very much. I, I asked you to say something at the end, and rightly you asked them to say something at the end. That's really good. Um, thank you so much for taking the time. We are very impressed with your delivery and your courage and your vision and the responsibility that you've dumped on our shoulders. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next submitter, Joanna Paul, she here. Welcome.
thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, I presume, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but anyway, you've presumably got a copy of my submission, so obviously there's a lot in it, and there are a lot of questions asked. Um, so I'll try and keep it succinct and within those three minutes that you um, have provided for me. Um, I think the children provided a really nice segue about affordability, and I was going to come in from a different direction, um, but I think the thing is, sure, we've, we've got to balance the books, whether it's a council or another commercial organisation. We've got income, we've got outgoings, we've got nice-to-haves, we've got must-haves. Um, but as we know, we've got a district that depends heavily on its rates for its income. Um, and year after year, the rates keep on going up. Um, in my own personal situation, the last 10 or 11 years, our rates have increased by 85%. Um, and this certainly isn't sustainable or affordable for us. Um, I'm of the age where I'll be retiring um, shortly. And um, once you get into that stage, depending on your savings, if you're dependent on the superannuation, um, it becomes a significant amount. Um, the average proposed rates in the latest or in the, in the, in the proposed long-term plan, um, averaging across the residential districts of, of the Kapiti District, um, comes to $3,233. That represents a 14.3% of a retired person's income of a single living alone loan benefit or if you're living with somebody else who doesn't, a partner who doesn't qualify, it would be 18.6%. Now, that's the average. Um, I just did a quick um, calculation of what it would be um, for me, and it would be um, significantly, or our rates would be significantly higher. Um, so it's, it, it's significant when we talk about increases in rates year after year. Um, and if we add to that, under the council's proposed capital expenditure over the next three years, it amounts to about a threefold increase from 70 million in the last three years to, from what I can understand from the plan, to $220 million for the next three years. Then you've got OPEX on top of that. So that's an effective increase in rates, if you're not looking at anything else, um, of 25% or more. Now, you have got borrowings, yes, and you have got these other initiatives that you have uh, discussed and asked us to comment on in the plan. Um, but it's a matter of what do we need, what can we afford, what are necessary, what's our business, what's our core business. Um, and it seems to me that the strategy isn't a strategy, that we're talking about securing our future. A lot of the things that are in there are taking away from our very future, just for the reasons I've mentioned, in terms of affordability and sustainability. Um, they're nice to have, for sure. And, you know, you ask a lot of the residents here, not all of whom are ratepayers, um, for what they'd like to vote for. Yes, let's tick all the boxes. Um, so the question is, how are we going to pay for these? And we've talked, you've talked about rates increases, you've talked about a CCO, and you've talked about borrowings. A CCO, well, as I mentioned in my submission, um, <laughs> it's a structure. We haven't got the you haven't provided the information. There's a real scarcity, paucity of information in that document securing our future from which we can evaluate the options, the pros and cons, the benefits, the costs, the evaluations. How are we supposed to evaluate if that information's not provided there, or those options? So um, I would ask for a bit better information in the future, but for now I would t ask you to take into consideration the affordability and the sustainability of what you're, you're proposing. And before you undertake any new initiatives, big initiatives as some of these things are, just demonstrate that you have got the wherewithal to actually put in place, for example, you've approved the gateway, let's see how that turns out. Can you do that to cost? Is it going to be profit generating? What is the cost to the community before you undertake these other huge ticket I big ticket items? Please. Councillor Randall. Yeah, um, thank you. In fact, I was just going to ask you to just to share your views, A, on the Waikanae Library, where you made a comment, and the briefly, very briefly, the Cafferty Gateway, which you've just mentioned anyhow. But I just wonder if you could highlight those two. All right. Well, look, the 
The Why Can I Library, I mean, you could argue that actually in this day and age with um, the internet and electronic means that a physical presence we actually we, we, less, we need less and less. And that would actually be true of a gateway too in so many respects because it, as I understand it, 80% of, of it is there to, as a fire security measure. Um, so people before, in the five minutes before they go over to Capiti Island, um, they check, they check their bags and things, but the rest of it might be a visitor centre and a gift cent shop and a, and a cafe. Um, if it's a visitor centre, most people go online these days, and I, and I know increasingly for myself, I'm reading online too. I borrow through the library, but it doesn't, I don't physically go to the library. Um, but I know that's not true of all people, so it's important that education, um, that we, we maintain a well-educated community and give people the options. The gateway, I think, is different. There are a number of things again it. Um, it was, it was fast-tracked at a huge rate, and I, and I assume it's because of trying to get the money from the government, that, but just because that money's there doesn't mean to make, uh, doesn't ensure that it makes good financial sense. Well, it's logical. I mean, I've provided a number of um, reasons in my submission, um, but, I, but I cannot understand this council who de declared a climate emergency would, if they're going to put a physical building of that size, put it on an extraordinarily narrow strip of land that is vulnerable to any potential sea level rise. Um, we talk about climate change the whole time in this community. It makes a nonsense. I mean, that alone, <laughs> apart from everything else. So I don't view the gateway favourably. I don't think the consul adequate consultation has been undertaken. I listened. I wasn't here physically, but I sat online and I listened to the submissions. And I was very concerned to hear, I didn't know anything about the fact that one of the operators hadn't even been consulted, and I think that's appalling. Um, and that the numbers that were used in the, um, in the projected visitors were unrealistic um, and well-founded. And then on top of that, when I went and did some reading later, and I read Price Waterhouse's, um, I don't know what, you call, what it was called, but, but to... They, they actually recommended an option, and when I read what their brief was, it wasn't to recommend an option. So there was some funny stuff going on there, and I, and I, I, I just think it's been rushed through, and it's going to have ramifications for the community in terms of costs going forward, and I'm not, I'm not even confident that this council can do things according to budget. We've, we've had this debacle with the sea, Paikokariki Sea Wall, whether you are pro that sort of expenditure or not. That was a commitment made years ago in a previous long-term plan, and there was oodles of community consultation on that. And I'm, I'm not sure of where the council assets sit behind it, but I'm sure that an element of protecting that, providing a sea wall is to protect council assets, therefore rate pay assets. If we're not going to do it that way, and I understand that the length of the, um, it's going to provide a life, the timber alternative that's been proposed in the plan is going to have a lifetime of 25 years as opposed to 50 years for the original plan. And I understand that council assets have a, um, a lifetime of 80 years, up to 80 I, I think years. the question was asked about the gateway, but um, um, yeah, Councillor Randall, have you got another question? Okay. You're done. Um, my question has been answered. Thank you very much. Thanks. Councillor Compton. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Through the Mayor, um, Fiora, thank you for coming along today. I'm just picking up on a point in your written submission where you say you're in favour of putting the brakes on growth in the Kapiti district, and you, you say you're in favour of that because you want to preserve the livability of the district. Um, I guess one of the challenges is that it's that very livability that attracts people to move here, and we can't stop people from wanting to move here. And you've heard this uh, just before from the students from Pakakariki School talking about that their friends are being forced out of the mm. district because of worsening housing affordability, mm. Mm. Um, and that's because supply is not keeping up with demand. Mm -hmm. So how would you suggest, you know, we can't stop people wanting to move here, so how do we accommodate that growth so that we don't have those heartbreaking stories of, uh, you know, these young people losing their well, friends suppose, because of this I suppose it's crisis. got to be very clear in the zoning, the enabling. I mean, council was there as an enabler, um, whether it's speeding up consent, but first of all, being very clear about, and I see that there are proposal about where some new areas of development might be, and I don't know quite whether that's confirmed or not. There was talk about, I think, Pekka Pekka and Waikanae. 
Um, I, I don't remember that being consulted on within the community and whether it ought to be, um, but it's certainly stated in the document. Um, so if that's a definite, um, then I guess it's now making it happen and, and providing, you know, if people are putting in consents, enabling that to happen. It's not actually providing the housing. Um, but if, that, if that's a done deal and, you know, that area is open, yes, but it's got to be done with the most, as, to make it as attractive. I mean, yes, no, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, certainly you can't stop growth, but it's managed growth. And in a, in a, in a sort of a, in a well thought out way. Um, hmm, I don't know, you know, I just, I am, I mean, of course, we've got, the, we've got the expressway and we've got another expressway about to open. Um, so yes, we will have, we've obviously had movement here, we will continue to, but the only thing that's limiting the numbers of people that are here will be the number of uh, sections available. And that's got to be managed by council, presumably, and I don't know if that's done in consultation with the community because maybe the community does or doesn't want that. But um, I don't think in terms of whether that provides any greater rating because there are going to be costs involved in providing infrastructure too. So I, I don't Councillor Compton, we got another question? Mm. No. Um, Councillor Pravano. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, um, Joanna, for coming along today and, and providing a very um, detailed submission. Um, I just wanted to um, pick up, one well, of my questions was actually answered um, by the previous councillor um, in asking it, but I just wanted to, I was interested in your comments on the library. Um, are you aware now that there's a thought more around um, libraries being community hubs, particularly um, when there's a lot more social isolation these days? Um, I can imagine that, yes. I mean, I think it's important too, and if it's a community hub, which Perhaps we don't need to have as many community hubs. Um, I mean, I'm not pro or gin it. Um, if, if I think a library is a, an important resource, and if it's if it provides that gathering point as well, well, you know, it, it's important. Mm. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Kia ora, through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much for coming and presenting to us today. I, I note that you've said in in your submission, council should not take a bigger role in housing. But I wonder whether that's just from the perspective that you think that we're proposing that we become developers and, and build, because later in your um, submission you go on to talk about the different enabling roles, which is still taking a bigger role in housing. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wasn't sure too, because there was a commitment, what it looks like, well, it's sort of a, a budgeted commitment in the document, uh, sort of several hundreds of thousands that have been potentially going to be put aside for doing a bit of research and the second one I haven't got in front of me sort of indicated a bit more than just an enabling role so it wasn't clear in the document to me quite what was proposed. Um, so just to be clear you are supportive of an enabling role but you're not supportive of being a developer. Yes and, and, you, and you can only you can see that happening Auckland's some years ago went out of, of community housing, Kororo and it's Long term proposed long term plan is proposing it gets out. Thank and you for that clarification. Mm, mm. Much appreciated. Councillor yeah. Elliott. Oh, thank you, Joanna, for your, um, your marvellous sub submission. It's really, really quite good uh, good advice and good information there. Um, I'm really um, just curious to know that um, whether or not you were aware that when we went through this, council went through this process in 2018. Uh, and got a, a mandate from the, the public on issues. Um, it included, I was wondering if you were aware at this point in time that there was 75% of submitters were in support of the Cavity Gateway project and that that is something that was stated in the reports on the 25th of February. Uh, but they probably weren't voting on a specific proposal such as that gateway that is proposed now. A, uh, gate, a gateway is a concept, yes, versus a gateway is the 260 square metre or whatever it is thing on, on McLean Park. I'm not sure. I, I don't know, but I'm presuming that was a concept back in 2018 versus an actual footprint with a plan of so many square metres and a gift shop and a cafe and a whatever. No. Um, thank you. you know, that gives us a good idea of what the public are, are, are aware of now as far as the consultation processes that we've gone through. But thank you. Thank you very much for coming and presenting your submission. Thank you for taking the time to come and speak to us. Thank you.